Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. So not only do I want to talk about this short story, but I also want to talk a little about the Cthulhu mythos itself and how it's basically become a huge part of the horror genre. So, as always, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and let's begin. <laughs> So, The Call of Cthulhu. It's a short story by H.P. Lovecraft. It's fairly simple. It basically follows this uh, man, last name Thurston. He basically just goes by Thurston. And he is following the trail left by his late uncle, whose mind was shattered, and he died. He um, basically is following this trail of letters and notes and information, which kind of gets him all the way down this rabbit hole after doing many interviews and learning about these strange dreams people have been having and stuff and learning about just all these weird things that are happening around this town he ends up discovering this cult him and a bunch of other people basically discover this ancient cult and they basically worship these ancient creatures one of which is similar to this small figurine that he found which is of just this grotesque little creature with wings and like an octopus face and bulbous head and stuff you know the classic image of cthulhu so the cult they come to learn is a cult of cthulhu they are the ones who worship cthulhu and they are hoping to find ryla the city the fallen city or the sunken city falling from the stars or whatever and like basically the place where cthulhu sleeps in order to wake him up because if the stars are correct then the ancient ones the elder things can live again on earth but if the stars are not right then they are in a death-like sleep and currently the stars are not right but of course because this is the call of cthulhu story later on when thurston is all the way in new zealand he goes off the coast of new zealand they're exploring and basically and all this stuff and they find the um they find an island they don't really understand what's going on with this island off the coast of new zealand because the coastline is all weird and gooey and kind of gross and stuff little do they know they have found the city of ryla Basically, while exploring, one of the people on ship, one of the people on board, one of the crew members, accidentally, like, opens the portal door to release Cthulhu. Basically, unbeknownst to them, the stars had become correct, and uh, Cthulhu and other creatures similar to him probably were able to wake up at that time. Or at least the stars are correct for Cthulhu itself. So... As they're basically on this ship and they're chilling in the water, basically this portal opens up and this giant creepy, like, you know, Cthulhu monster comes out and one of the crew members immediately loses his mind. He basically starts laughing hysterically and just like, just goes absolutely utterly insane. He dies some days later. And so basically they try to turn the ship around and try to immediately get the heck out of there. But they realize Cthulhu basically is potentially standing up i guess but his shoulders and everything is still out of the water is gigantic so there's basically no running away from it so they decide to like try to turn around and actually attack it so they're on the boat and they ram the boat into cthulhu's face and they basically assume that they've done some sort of damage because the face more or less explodes and turns into like gelatinous goo and stuff but almost immediately after they kind of think they've done some damage it immediately starts to regenerate like really really fast and stuff but one of the things that I complain about, though, is the fact that we don't really know what happens exactly after that. Because if Cthulhu can regenerate that quickly, even them trying to turn the boat around again and trying to take off and go away, they still wouldn't really be able to get away. So I don't really quite understand how Cthulhu just kind of left them alone, because it basically jumps to a later time. That's how we also find out later on one of the crew members died as they're trying to get away like um thurston like as they're trying to get away he doesn't there's no you know there's no guidance he doesn't have a proper heading or anything like he doesn't know where the boat's going they're just trying to get away so even in the time after that when they're still on the boat and one of the other members of the crew has died because of insan his insanity cthulhu hasn't come back to attack them and they've also gotten away from the cult that worships cthulhu because they also would like to keep it secret so the story essentially ends with this man having um, gone through this experience that has changed him forever, has partially destroyed his mind, and has caused this level of paranoia that will undoubtedly destroy him. Because he knows that um, he is the last witness, and he just, in his head, he just knows that the cult knows that he knows, so he just knows that they're coming after him. So he's basically always looking over his shoulder, and he's terrified and completely petrified that the cult is going to come up and try to silence him. So... 
regardless of his level of sanity that he has left, his mind is basically forever altered with this level of paranoia and just the experience that he's gone through. So that was essentially the short story, The Call of Cthulhu. It's a very simple story. It's very simple to explain because the majority of the story, you're really just rereading these accounts that he discovered and you're listening to tales of these weird dreams that other people had. But the actual events that happen in the story happen fairly quickly. So that's one of the uh, hallmarks of a Lovecraft story though. That there's a lot of discussion about the mental state of the characters and the before and after basically and some of the discovery process so that you can get a very good thorough understanding of their mental state so that you can understand what happens after they encounter the Eldritch monster so that we have a good juxtaposition between how they were before and how they were after they you know have this experience. So Lovecraft's first short story, Dagon, didn't really kind of kick off the Lovecraftian mythos in the way Cthulhu did. Something about Cthulhu really sparked the imaginations of so many people and kind of led to all of this later on expansion. So even other writers of his time would be inspired by his work and like apply his mythology to their work so that the creatures they created could fit within that mythology. So a lot of that is really cool. So a lot of the expansion of the creatures that we know now of the Lovecraft pantheon are actually characters and creatures created by other writers. So even though these stories were published like now about a hundred years ago or so, there are people today that are still greatly influenced by the Lovecraftian mythos and the entire Cthulhu mythos. So I want to talk really quickly about some movies that were inspired by Lovecraft. Some of my favorite movies that are clearly inspired by Lovecraft. So I want to, first of all, I want to talk about the newest one that's, you know, made it to my list of favorites. And it is an actual direct adaptation of a Lovecraft short story called A Color Out of Space. It is a newer movie that I saw on Shudder and it has Nicolas Cage in it. So I immediately clicked it and had to watch it. But the story basically is similar, much very, very close to the actual short story too. So the story basically is following this family on a farm. They have like an alpaca farm and like they're, you know, just doing their thing, normal, typical family and stuff. And this one night, a meteor crash lands on their property. And in the movie, the color is a magenta-like color. But in the actual short story, the color is indescribable. It is, there's no word for it. It doesn't exist on our color spectrum or anything like that. It's a color out of space. In the movie, there's a consideration of the meteorite, but before anything's done about it, the meteorite kind of melts and the color itself permeates the land and starts to infect everything. You even see like insects that are changed. You see plants that change. Um, they're growing tomatoes and stuff and the tomatoes are like huge steroid tomatoes and stuff and like, but they taste rotten when you bite into them. All the characters have different mental effects of it. Like Nicolas Cage himself becomes, well, he becomes more classic Nick Cage and kind of goes crazy and just get that performance that most people know or expect from Nicolas Cage. But in reality, it's because it's messing with his mind and his perception and his temper and stuff like that. And he also seems to get a little, a little DID going, like his personality is inconsistent and stuff. So it's definitely an influence by that. It influences the son's like weird attention thing. He can't seem to pay attention to anything. It affects, it seems to affect the daughter the least because she's kind of more or less our main character that we follow through. So it doesn't affect her as much. But it, it has some major effects on everyone else and eventually the entire family is um, consumed by this color. So in the short story, there is a water uh, Publix Works worker for the city that um, stumbles upon all the stuff that happened on the farm. So he basically pieces together based on the evidence, everything that happens. And that's how we kind of get the short story. But in the movie, they decided to have that um, guy show up much earlier. So the Publix Works worker shows up and is able to actually witness a lot of this stuff happens and he gets to know some of the other characters. So by the time it basically becomes him telling the story, he's a witness to it as opposed to somebody that's just really, really good at piecing information together. So I really like that story a lot and I like that movie so, so much. Apart from having a lot of fun, Nicolas Cage in it, the story is just such great. I mean, it's, it is Lovecraft, so it makes sense that it will have that unknowable, unfathomable, just like, you know, just that... Un I guess the only word is unknowable, just that insane space kind of thing that like make you feel small and make humans feel incredibly insignificant. So it definitely has that. And I really, really, really like it. <laughs> so one of my favorite directors, John Carpenter, also has a couple movies that are very, very much inspired by Lovecraft. So the first one I want to talk about is The Thing. So The Thing is heavily inspired by Lovecraft. And most people already know the story of The Thing because the John Carpenter version is actually a remake 
of a 1950s movie that is based on a book, which is all inspired by Lovecraft. So basically what it is is a creature from space, from deep in space, that you know is unknowable, unfathomable, nearly indescribable. Actually, it's completely indescribable because it has no true form that we know of. It crash lands on Earth and is frozen in Antarctica. And when a research team discovers the frozen site, they basically, or actually, I don't think they they don't unfreeze it, but basically they discover the crash site and it's like unfrozen and it starts to slowly assimilate all the people in the research facility in order to basically survive because it's just a creature doing what the creature does. But it every time it's left alone with a dog or a person or anything like that it takes it assimilates them into itself and it can mimic their form so the entire story is about who you can trust so the whole story keeps going and going and going and then people keep getting knocked off until we're left with two people who are basically left mentally broke shocked and terrified in the cold definitely going to freeze to death but at the end of it they can't trust each other they're incapable of trust at this point because the level of paranoia that this creature has instilled in them is so completely thorough so it's similar to lovecraft and the unknowable unfathomable indescribable creature that they're dealing with and as well as the complete shift and change in their mental states by the end but it's a little more you know at home i guess is the way i'll say it it feels a little bit closer to home than a lot of lovecraft stuff like the comparison between like an alien that i can conceptualize as a shape-shifting type of alien versus this just color <laughs> that has all these effects and stuff like it's insane but i do think it definitely falls into that category and carpenter himself has definitely said he is totally inspired by lovecraft which is even more evidence in his other movie M in the uh, <laughs> So the Lovecraft influences are even more apparent in John Carpenter's movie, In the Mouth of Madness. So In the Mouth of Madness is a trippy, trippy movie and is really actually hard to describe. Well, kind of. So um, in this movie, Carpenter definitely is inspired by Lovecraft as well as the fandom of Lovecraft and other popular writers like Stephen King. So he takes the um, the idea of this fandom and stuff and kind of plays with it metatextually. Similar to the Lovecraft story, um, Necronomicon, there is a implication that the Sutter Kane, who is the main writer guy, the Stephen King stand-in and H.P. Lovecraft stand-in, is implied that his stories, if he gets enough people to read them, not only will they go insane, but it will unleash some sort of eldritch monster creature kind of thing, kind of like what happens in Necronomicon. And the entire thing centers around this book agent who is basically trying to basically fight against this idea of sane and insane kind of thing because everything that happens in the book that's being written is starting to happen in real life. And then it kind of becomes exposed to him that he's just a character written by the writer and stuff. And it literally is just a play on sane and insane. They have a conversation about it and the entire thing just kind of... It, it ends, it keeps going and going and going until the last um, bit we get is of the main character utterly and completely insane. He realizes that, well, the, 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 uh, it's it's so good. I can barely even describe the way it kind of, I can really, I can barely articulate it, I guess is the issue. is because they have a conversation early on in the movie where they basically say um, to a sane person, like, if, if basically if one thing was to flip in reality, any sane person would become insane. So it's just a matter of perception, right? So the main character that we follow, he is sane throughout the entire thing, but he gradually goes insane because he knows reality as reality and he understands this book as a book. But when the story ends, every single thing that happened in the book happened in real life. And now he's watching the movie of the the movie adaptation of the book in which he is a character because he is a character in the book. So it just... He is left completely mind shattered. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to him. And he's just laughing hysterically at it because he's completely insane. So while I can't really perfectly describe that movie, I definitely do super, super, super severely recommend it. It's a great, great watch. But yes, our main character is driven utterly and completely insane by the end of it. And it's pretty neat. And it's totally a Lovecraftian kind of thing. The entire way the story works, there's a lot of hints of Cthulhu monsters and stuff. Carpenter was definitely heavily inspired, so he definitely went in that direction. But not only is Carpenter inspired and used the fandom of Stephen King and used his name quite a few times in order to explain the metatextual commentary they wanted to make in this movie, Stephen King kind of jumped in on it as well in his short story, The Mist. So Stephen King himself has also been very much inspired by Lovecraft just in general. 
because in the multiverse he created, there is spaces in between the different universes. And that space is called Todash Darkness or Todash Space. And in that space, nothing but eldritch, unknowable, indescribable monsters live there. It's literally the place where all the demons of every world and all that stuff comes from. So it's literally just monsters. <laughs> and in the movie and in the book The Mist, the government is basically doing the Arrowhead Project, which is supposed, like, the rumors say that they were trying to find a way into another dimension. They were trying to basically open a window into another dimension. But, of course, them being ignorant, not knowing, you know, how the cosmology or any of that kind of stuff works, they only opened a doorway into Todash space, which allowed all those monsters to kind of come through along with that mist, because that mist is probably a natural consequence of the Todash space or whatever. So, all those monsters come in and start killing everybody because humans are less than insignificant to them. We are, like, less than fleas to them and stuff so they just like come in and do their natural stuff but to us it's completely apocalyptic and terrifying and a lot of people there wasn't a whole lot of pure insanity well actually in the movie that main character at the end he's probably completely insane now because of what he had to do that movie has one of the greatest most sad endings ever <laughs> but either way that's neither here nor there the mist is a very heavily lovecraftian inspired work by stephen king and it's a really really good short story and i really like it so the lovecraftian cthulhu mythos has been very very popular for a long time and it is very influential on a lot of horror writers and a lot of directors and a lot of people just who love the horror genre so even in the video game world there's a video game called the call of cthulhu where it's a detective story and one of the four different endings has you actually summoning cthulhu so the cthulhu Cthulhu mythos is still very popular, still very much in fashion. <laughs> and the director of the adaptation of A Color Out of Space said he wants to do a trilogy. So his next one is supposed to be the Dunwich Horror, which is, you know, it's part of the mythos, but it's not as big with the creatures and monsters and things. But I still definitely look forward to <laughs> checking it out. Well, I guess I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So let me know in the comments down below, what are some of your favorite examples of like a Cthulhu mythos or Lovecraftian like cosmic horror monster example? Like what story has use of some sort of eldritch creature that you really enjoy? Let me know about that in the comments down below. So make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And we'll talk to y'all next time. Peace.